Welcome to Nolan on this, isn't it a beautiful day outside? I wore a coat and I was wondering why I did. It's a beautiful day and a great time to be able to come and gather together to worship our awesome God. My name is Nathan. I'm the lead pastor here at Knollwood. So if you're visiting with us, welcome. We're excited to have you here with us. Please fill out one of these connection cards. Uh, you can do it digitally by doing the QR code, or you can uh, s just fill it out and plop it in the offering plate as it goes by, just to let us know that you're here. And we'd love to be able to connect with you. And that's how we connect with you. And who knows, you might even get some food out of it. So um, please fill that out. There's lots of classes that are happening and coming up, so I encourage you to check out our website and the Church Center app for more information about what's happening today or happening coming up. Uh, today, however, we are celebrating uh, Ryan and Victoria's upcoming wedding with a wedding shower, which is open for... Uh, the father of the bride is clapping a lot. So... <laughs> Uh, we're, we're excited for that, but that's open up for everyone, so that's going to be downstairs. Please bring some favorite finger food to share, um, and just come together and celebrate that. We also have another church-wide potluck happening on April 21st, so let us know if you're coming to that, and what you will be bringing when you register online. Uh, this is a potluck lunch that's open for everyone, but it's going to be showcasing some of the ministries that we support as a church, but also some of the things that happen around the church and how you can get involved and learn more about what's happening. Uh, something that's been exciting that I've been watching pretty closely uh, is about four weeks ago, I think, we had a members meeting, um, and our, one of our elders, Keith, announced that we were looking to buy some more chairs uh, for our auditorium, so we're, we were looking to buy 100 chairs. Your generosity has been amazing as we have met that goal, actually. So... Um, <laughs> So the new chairs have been ordered this past week, so we praise God for what he has done, and it really blew me away. Um, so we give as an act of worship that reflects the generosity that our Lord and Savior poured out on us. And your generosity is not just about chairs. It really isn't. That's quite the minority of it. Uh, but the generosity that you give that reflects Christ helps the gospel ministry here at Knollwood uh, on Sundays and our outreach on Fridays and our kids ministries and our youth ministries and all of those things that happen as we seek to be disciples who make disciples of Jesus Christ. So thank you so much for your generosity and please consider how you can continue to reflect that generosity on a weekly basis as we worship God in that. Those are a couple of our announcements. So if you're able, please stand with us as we worship our awesome God. Revelation chapter 5 verses 11 and I'm going to read to 14, even though it says 13, because I can do this. <laughs> the word of the Lord says this. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbing, number, numbering myriads and myriads of thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them say to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Lord, we come and we gather to worship you, to make much of you. So, Lord, I pray with our voices, as your word is read, as your word is preached, Lord, I pray that we would make much of you. May we decrease, may you increase this very day. Amen. Creatures of the God and King, lift up a voice and with us sing, go praise Him, hallelujah, thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with soft gleam, go praise Him, go praise Him, hallelujah, hallelujah. Things 
our Creator bless and worship Him with humbleness. Oh, praise Him! Hallelujah! Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit three in one. No oh, praise Him, no oh, praise Him. Hallelujah! Hallelujah, hallelujah. All the redeemed washed by his blood. Come and rejoice in his great love. Oh, praise him. Hallelujah. Christ has defeated every sin. Cast all your burdens now in him. Oh, praise Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. He shall return in proud array. Heaven and earth will join to say, Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. Then who shall fall and bend the knee? Creatures of our God and King, oh praise Him, oh praise Him, Hallelujah, 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 you have done great things. 
Because you've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. Free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, oh, they can alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh you have the great things. We dance in your freedom, of they can alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. You have done great things. Oh, God, you do great things. Church, you may be seated. As we continue to worship God, it brings us to a place of confessing our sins before him and looking to Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. As we turn to the word of God, hear now the words of Christ as Maris reads from the book of John. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say, You will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The sun remains forever. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Let us pray as we continue to worship and reflect upon God's word together. Lord, your word tells us that we are free if we abide in you. Lord, you are truth, and holding to you as truth leads those who believe to be free from the slavery of sin. This doesn't happen because of how much we know, but because of our relationship with you, which has been purchased by your, by your blood, which comes through relief and repentance. We are free by the work of the Holy Spirit that has been accomplished through Jesus' death and his resurrection. We praise you for this work that you have done, Lord. And we are free to serve you and fulfill our purpose that we were created for as your image bearers because of this word. Lord, we also know that because we are free, we are called to a new life. 
We are no longer slaves to sin, but are now adopted children of the living God. But as we reflect upon this freedom that you have purchased, that comes uh, as we abide in you, we also acknowledge that we have spent more time abiding in other things than you. We have elevated our hobbies, social media. We have cherished other truths other than yours. We've depended upon other things or people rather than you and so many other things. As one pastor put it, Lord, you don't decide to to worship. Everyone worships something. The only choice you get to is what do you worship. And how often have we chosen to worship something else but you? We have acted as those who are still slaves to the sin you have freed us from. So, Lord, forgive us when we don't abide in you and cause us to desire to abide in you even more. So that, you, uh, so that we may greater reflect you, that our witness would be even stronger. So, Lord, as we abide in you, may our witness be faithful and effective. So, Lord, we pray that for our church, but we also pray that for other churches, and we pray that for Summerside Community Church and for Pastor Leo and the elders, that you may give them the wisdom to shepherd your church at Summerside well. May they, too, abide in you. And, Lord, we pray that their witness may be faithful and effective. May you bless them as a church, and may they grow in maturity and faith. May they see how you use them to grow your kingdom. And Lord, your word also tells us in 1 Timothy 2, it says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Lord, your word commands us to pray for our government, so we pray for them. We pray for our prime minister, we pray for our premier, our mayor, and all of those who are in government. We pray that you give them wisdom to govern well. We pray that they may lead in such a way that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Lord, we pray above all that you would save them. Lord, we gather to make much of you today. And Lord, you are worthy of it all. And you were slain, you bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, and we esteemed you stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. Lord, you are worthy of our praise. So, Lord, may our words that are sung, your word that is preached and read, all of this, Lord, make much of you. I pray for my brother Chris as he preaches your word today. Give us an attitude of worship as we listen to your word being preached. And as we worship you through our financial giving, may it reflect the generosity that you have shown us on the cross that you died for our sins and rose from the dead we thank you for uh how this enables us to further the gospel ministry here at nolwood and i think of our kids ministry our youth ministry our street evangelism even our gatherings right here right now that uh, allows us to worship that giving enables us to do so lord continue to use this for your glory and use this worship to grow our kingdom uh, your kingdom as we seek to be faithful disciples who make disciples of Jesus Christ. And amen. amen. Church, if you may rise as we sing Christ the Shore and Steady Anchor. Sure and steady anchor 
through the floods of unbelief. Hopeless somehow, oh my soul, now lift your eyes to Calvary. This my ballast of assurance, see his love forever prove. That great horizon, clouds behind and life secure, and the calm will be the better for the storms that we do. Christ, the shore of our salvation, ever faithful, ever true. shall never be Sin had left a grim 
We continue to worship our awesome God together. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 24 says this. And as we read this, if you haven't got a communion cup, you can put your hand up and our ushers will get you a communion cup as we worship God together. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 24 says this. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we come together, I'm going to suggest a few things. I'm going to suggest four things that we can see from this passage. Where we're called to remembrance. We're reminded of our unity. We're reminded of why we can give thanks And we're reminded of our hope. Communion calls us to remembrance. Can we agree that we are probably the most forgetful people in the world? And Jesus knows that. We forget the gospel all the time. All the time. So this is a time of remembrance. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And we remember how we have been united with God in Christ. We remember that all of God's promises are yes and amen in him. We remember that we are washed, accepted, and heard, and free from sin, death, and Satan. We remember how the gospel has set us free, and free indeed, and that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Communion reminds us of our unity. As Paul, to his letter to the Galatians in chapter 2, verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, and the life I live In the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In the Lord's Supper, we are reminded of our unity with each other and with Christ. In communion, we are reminded of our thanksgiving. When we come to this time, we come with a heart of thanksgiving for the gift of God's grace through his Son, Jesus Christ. At this time, we give thanks for the new creation. We are in Christ and celebrate our new identity as beneficiaries of the cross. We give thanks because we remember how God has made us people whom he has forgiven and loved through the atoning work of his son, Jesus Christ. Communion reminds us of how the one who is high comes and becomes low for us. What type of attitude of thanksgiving should we have as we come in this time of communion? So we give thanks. So when we read those words in 1 Corinthians 11, we reflect on those things. Remembrance, unity, and thanksgiving. And this is an ordinance. It's a command. That's something we are called to do. We choose to do it on the first Sunday of every month. Some do it every week. And it's just like baptism is a command that helps us to remember and reminds us of why we have unity and why we can give thanks. So let us take time to reflect upon the sin that put our Savior on the cross. Why we can be thankful. Why we can be united. About how we are no longer the sum of all of our sins through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Who died for our sins and rose from the dead. Let us just take a couple of minutes to reflect upon these things. I'm going to ask my brother Keith Albion to pray for this bread. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we remembered last week the death and resurrection of your son, and as we now come around this communion table, Lord, we remember that there was a price that had to be paid. And Lord, we rejoice that the 
the price was paid once and for all. But Lord, as we take this bread, we remember your son's broken body on that cross for us. Lord, he willingly submitted his body to the beating to take our transgressions away, Lord. So, Lord, as we take this bread, we say thank you to you. Amen. First Corinthians 11, as I had read, verses 23 to 24 says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. This is Paul speaking to the church. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I'm going to ask my brother Dave DeHaan to pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for how you took the, this cup, shed your blood for the, the remission of our sins. We recall your word, too, where you spoke there, the soul that sins sure will surely die. And also, you know, the wages of sin is death. And truly, Lord, we were in bondage. We needed you as a savior, and you lovingly and willfully came without sin to die in our place, to take upon yourself our guilt and bear all, all of God's wrath. Oh, Lord, we thank you for this cup of your shed blood. And not only that our sins might be paid for, but that we will rise again and be with you forever. So in your name, Lord, we pray. The Apostle Paul continues on, verse 25. He says, in the same way also he took the cup, and after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. If you notice that I didn't say four points. I only said three because the, fir the fourth one comes now. Communion calls us to hope. Paul ends his teaching to the church in Corinth with this reminder. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When we participate in communion together, we are looking forward to the time when we will eat this meal with Jesus himself. We will eat this looking forward to the great wedding banquet in the new heavens and the new earth, completely restored, where God makes all things new. Brothers and sisters, communion points us beyond whatever is happening today. Whatever our circumstances, whatever your burdens are, whatever the hardships you are carrying today, communion points us beyond that. Because Jesus is coming back for his bride. And just as sure as he came the first time, he is coming back again. So we preach this to ourselves. We proclaim this truth to each other and to one another and to each ourselves. Every day and every time we do this, we proclaim these truths. At this time, we take time to reflect upon God's grace towards us and how we can share grace to those who are in need. So during communion, we take up a, a special offering that goes into our benevolent fund that goes directly into um, our food cupboard and helping those who are in need. Uh, as we reflect upon God's grace that he has showed us. And this is our opportunity to show and share the gospel to those who are in need. So if you're able and willing, please participate in that. If not, will you continue to worship with us and stand with me as we sing the doxology together.
Hello, kids. Come on up. So welcome to family worship. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Come one, come all. There's still room. Everyone come. Okay, great. So today we are going to be looking at question 13 in the New City Catechism. We're going through this uh, as part of our family devotions, and here is where we're at. Oh, question. Okay. Same question, different numbering. Question 14. Did God create us unable to keep his law? Hmm. 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 At the point where God made Adam and Eve, were they unable to keep the law? Hmm, interesting. Here, let's go, let's go check this out. Okay, the answer is no. So at that point when God created us, we were in a state of innocence. Okay? Um, we, he made us very good. He made, he made all of us in his image, and we were very, very good. But it didn't stay there. And we have no idea how long it took, but it doesn't sound like it was very long at all. Adam and Eve sinned. And when they sinned, they became this word called disobedient. And that means that we didn't do what God wanted. And that meant that there was a consequence and that there was a punishment. And because of Adam and Eve's sin, we are all sinful. We're all guilty. Yeah. And that's because sin has infected all of us. And every part of us has that sin in it. Now, that doesn't mean that we're as bad as we could ever possibly be, thankfully. Um, but it does mean that it, 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 it impacts everything that we do. Yeah. From the moment that we're born. So now, the, now the conclusion on our life is that we are unable to keep the law. And we can't do it. Let's look at the, let's look at the verse. This is Romans 5, verse 12. It says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam, okay? And death through sin, that's why we die, all right? Death, and so, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. That's why we die. That's why our bodies break down and we stop living. It's because we sin. And that's not the end of the story, but that's where we're going to stop today. All right, let's see the video, and then we're going to be dismissed. After Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus did not eat for 40 days and 40 nights. He prayed and thought about God's plan for his life. When those days were over, Jesus was hungry. Then the devil, who tempts people to sin, came up to Jesus and he said, If you are really God's son, prove it. Tell these stones to become bread. If Jesus used his power to turn the stones into bread, he could eat them so he wouldn't be hungry anymore. But Jesus refused. Instead of listening to the devil, Jesus chose to trust God to meet his needs. Jesus said, God's word says that man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The devil tempted Jesus again. He took Jesus to the top of the temple in Jerusalem and he said, if you are really God's son, prove it. Jump off this temple and, and trust God to protect you. The devil even said, God's word says that God will order his angels to keep you safe and they will protect you so that you will not even strike your foot against a stone. The devil had used words from scripture, but Jesus knew the devil's command was foolish. Jesus reminded him, 
God's word also says, do not test the Lord your God. Finally, the devil took Jesus to a high mountain. He showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and how great they were. The devil said to Jesus, I will give you all the riches and power of these kingdoms. They have been given to me and I can give them to anyone I want. If you want them, all you have to do is fall down and worship me. Jesus resisted temptation again. He replied, go away, Satan. God's word says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil left Jesus and angels came right away to serve Jesus. Throughout all these temptations, Jesus never sinned. Jesus was tempted, but he trusted God and he never sinned. Jesus is perfect and righteous. A perfect sacrifice was required to take away sin. Jesus was that perfect sacrifice. He died on the cross to free us from sin and to give us the power to say no to temptation. Okay, let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for these kids. Thank you that you have created them and that you are drawing them to yourself. And we pray that they would be saved and that they would know you at a young age. We pray for them as they go down to Sunday school. Pray that, they, that you would open their ears and open their minds so that they can hear and understand what you're, what you're telling them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Dave. My, uh, my name is Pastor Chris. Uh, I'm the associate pastor. If you're visiting, welcome. We're glad that you can come and serve with us today. If you don't have a Bible, uh, there's a Bible in front of the chair, uh, in the chair in front of you. Please take that, use that today. Take that home. That's our gift to you. Have you ever been, uh, have you ever given a gift to someone and uh, you you save up that money, you give that gift, but you don't get quite the response that you were hoping when you gave that gift? You know, it's kind of a, oh, that's kind of nice. You know, you're like, um, or perhaps uh, you get it flat out rejected. You know, what what goes through your mind? How do you feel about that? Suppose there's a, a young man and you know, he's wooed some lady, and he's raised up all that money to buy that engagement ring. And, and so finally the day comes, he gets down on his knee, pops that big question with shaking and trembling, and she says, no. How do you think he'd feel? What do you think would be going through his mind at that time? Hurt? Pain? Maybe a little bit of anger? You know, that pain and sadness very easily morphs into anger. She said she loved me. She's a liar. How would you feel for that guy? Would you feel bad for him? You know, I'd think, you know, my first thought would be like, why didn't you talk about marriage before you proposed? (laughs) Probably the most obvious thing to ask. But what if he said to me, you know what? We did. She was committed. She said how much she loved me. She wanted to get married over and over again. Now what would you think of her? when she uttered that word, no. Anger for him, at least. Does he have a right to be angry? Well, today in our passage, we're going to see a story unfold with Cain and Abel, where a gift is offered, a gift is rejected, and anger takes over. And church, I think there's something here for us to learn um, and think about. How do we respond when we don't get what we expect? What does that maybe reveal going on in our own hearts. So if you have your Bibles with me, turn with me to Genesis 4. Genesis 4, we're going to read verses 1 to 16, so follow along with me in your Bibles. It says, Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. And so Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? 
He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield its Uh, yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face. I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you for your word today. And Lord, we pray now, Lord, that would you help, see the, help us see the subtleness of sin and bring conviction so that we might repent of it. Bring clarity and conviction, Lord, as I preach, Lord God, would you glorify yourself in and through this time, Lord God. We ask this now in Christ's name. Amen. Well, there's two observations we can find from our passage today, too. Uh, The first observation is found in verses 1 through 7, and that is an offer rejected and an anger conceived. An offer rejected and anger conceived. You see, the story has kind of shifted forward, hasn't it? Away from Adam and Eve, and and now it's on to their two sons, Cain and Abel. Eve, we read, gives birth to her firstborn son, Cain. And you kind of have to be thinking in your mind, okay, what was going on in Adam and Eve's mind? Are they thinking to themselves, will this be the son to crush the head of the serpent? Is this that offspring that God promised? And we read that Cain will follow in his father's footsteps, won't he? He'll become a worker of the ground. Cain will cultivate the fields. He'll plant seeds. He'll prune trees. He'll pull weeds, you know, everything necessary for him to bring forth fruit from the ground. And we read later, at some time later, a second son is born, Abel. And Abel will be a shepherd. He will be a keeper of flocks. He will care for them. He will lead them out to graze and he'll move them to other fields. This is to set the stage for what will follow. Because over the course of time, we read that Cain and Abel decide to bring an offering from the hard work of their labors to God. Cain brings forth some fruit. Same word. It's the same word we we read in in Genesis about fruit from the garden. He gives this to God as his offering. And Abel, we are told, brings forth the the firstborn from his flocks and their fat portions. And so Cain would offer up from what he worked and Abel from what he kept. Nothing really odd is going on here. They both wanted to give something back to God. Until we read in verses 4 and 5, And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. What in the world is going on? Cain's offer has been rejected? It's like that woman saying no to the proposal. We're left wondering, God, don't you love Cain? Did he not freely offer up to you from his hard work? This has really perplexed many people. You see, they both worked the fields. They both were willing to present or give up some of their hard work and offer it up to God. So why? On the surface, it would seem that God is just simply picking favorites. It would be like a parent picking a favorite between two children. How do you think the one who wasn't picked would feel? Is God a tyrant? Is he unfair? Does God arbitrarily decide what he will like and dislike, what he will accept and not accept? You know, some have suggested that God accepted Abel's offering because Abel probably offered up a lamb, foreshadowing the lamb to come, and why fruit just cannot cut it. But Cain was never given flocks, was he? He was a worker of the ground. God does not call us to give what we don't have, but from what we have, what he has given to us. And some suggest that it's because Abel offered up the best from his flocks, where no mention is made of Cain, uh, and him giving up maybe the first fruits. 
This is an observation, and it's an appropriate one to observe from the text. We know later God requires the firstborn of Israel's flock to be consecrated to him. We do know that. And we know that the fat portions were the best parts of the animal. But there's nothing in the text here that would suggest that God required that or was pleased with this. See, we need to be careful not to read something from a later text into an earlier text if Scripture does not make that connection for us. I could as easily make the claim that, well, it was done later in the Mosaic Law because Abel did that here now. But again, we don't see that connection. So from the surface, when we look at this, from our perspective, it seems hard to understand why. Why would God reject an offering made freely by someone? You know, I recall a time in my old job and a, a co-worker and, um, and he was not a Christian, not a fan of Christianity at all, but he, he decided he was going to read the Bible. And so, you know, read it from cover to cover, okay? like most people think you know, that's what they're going to do. And he started, and he got to this story, and he closed it up and said, nah, that's it. Not having it. God was unfair. You know, and I, I reflect on that story, and I think to myself, well, Does anyone read a biography and they get two pages in and they close and say, yeah, I think I've got it all figured out on who the guy is? No, you you read the whole biography to get a whole picture of who the guy is. There's more to the story, as we will see. So how does Cain respond to God's rejection of his offering? How would the man who got rejected when making his proposal respond? He responds by being very angry, very angry. This means he was burned with anger. He was incensed. He was fuming mad. Anger had been conceived. And his face, we read, falls. His countenance falls. He was visually affected by God's rejection of his offering. He was depressed. He was sad. And it was all over his face. Cain was angry at God, but does he have the right angry with God. My co-workers sure thought so. Let's be clear, there is such thing as a righteous anger, but it's never righteous anger when it's directed at God. So, we need to remember that. This is actually a sinful anger we're seeing here. And this type of anger can really manifest itself in two ways. The first way is by clamming up. By clamming up. This is, you know, when you get that stiff upper lip, you know. You, you get angry with someone. You storm off. You're never talking to them, never saying anything. All the while, you're stewing over it in your mind. You're going 12 rounds with that one guy in your ang- with your angry uh, anger. Or it's kind of like that stiff upper, or instead of the stiff upper lip, it's kind of like the stuck out lower lip, you know. Like, you know, you're pouting, you know. You know, curled eyebrows, you know. I'm seeing some women looking at their husbands right now. I don't know what that's about, but. A second way it can manifest itself is really by lashing out. We get that, right? We see that all the time. We all know what lashing out looks like. Some of us, we all understand. We've all done that. We've lashed out at people before. We know it's hard to be around such people, always feeling you're having to tiptoe around someone so that they don't blow a gasket. People who are never happy, who seem to have taken all their problems on you, maybe you're that person. You've had a rough day, someone gets angry with you, and so what do you do? You get angry at someone else. Your pride is hurt, so you need to, to restore it somehow by finding the, the first person around you, and you lash out in, in kind to them. See, the problem with anger is that it never delivers with its, what it promises. You either walk away not feeling justified because you never said just enough. Wait, wanting to go kind of give one more kind of that imaginative punch, if you will, you know? Or you feel justified because you really stuck it to them. It only builds up pride and ultimately makes you want to do it more and more, doesn't it? This anger is never sanctifying. What does James 1, 19 and 20 say? Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Sinful anger has a way of creating lots and lots of collateral damage, doesn't it? So what do we see here with Cain? He exhibits a claiming up anger. 
And so God asked Cain in verses 6 and 7, Why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? Wait, what? Why am I angry, God? You know why I'm angry. You know why my face has fallen. How can you ask me such a thing? And if I do well, I will be accepted. Did I not just do something well? When have you ever said those words to someone or thought those words? You see, God is not asking these questions as though he's missing some information. Only Cain can provide it. God is giving cha- a chance for Cain to think about why he is angry, why he is sad. He's giving a chance for communication and humility to come from Cain. God knows something about Cain, something that we are slowly starting to see. Like that woman who was proposed to, what if, what if she knew something? Something that you and I didn't know. Something that no one else could see. What if she knew with all certainty, though she loved this man, he did not love her? Then what would you think? Then would it make sense for her to reject this man's offering? He is the one not being truthful, not her. What makes the offering meaningful is the heart by which it is given. The offer, the offering and the offerer are inseparable. Why we see, and, and why, it's why we see in the next text that God had no regard for Cain and his offering, but he had regard for Abel and his offering. There was something about Cain, his heart, which was not well. So why did God not have regard for Cain's offering? Because Cain did not offer it up in faith. It's not just what you offer up to God, it's the heart by which you do it. In Hebrews 11.4, we see this. Hebrews 11.4 says, By faith, by faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And two verses later, it says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God. One scholar said it this way, Abel's faith was expressed when he offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. The difference was not in the substance of the sacrifices, but in the attitudes of the two brothers. What kind of attitude do you have when you offer up to God? Is it out of love of God, of what he has done? Or is it a hope he will somehow appease his anger, earn his favor, to boost your ego or how good you think you are. You're making offerings of your time, talents, and treasures to feel better about yourself. You have placed yourself over God. God alone is no longer sufficient for you. You need to contribute to the work of the cross. It has now become Christ plus fill in the blank equals approval equals satisfaction. And when you fail, and we all fail... You will feel like his approval has disappeared and you will lose your satisfaction. Christ is sufficient, brothers and sisters, because of who he is and what he has done. Offer up your gifts in light of that truth. You see, the offerings themselves were not the main issue. The heart was the main issue. Sure, we understand which one offers up can be an indication of the heart. We see a very limited description of what Cain gave, and we see a, a large description of what Abel gave. It might be an indication, but it is from the heart where our motives come from. God, knowing that anger is being conceived in the depths of Cain's heart, he will graciously and lovingly warn Cain of this danger. In verse 7, he says, Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. You see, sin is made to sound like a stalking predator, you know, seeking to pounce. It's looking for ways to attack and devour and kill. And Christian, God tells us a valuable truth here, one that we need to really pay attention to. We must rule over sin. Sin is out to kill you. It wants you. There's no flirting with it. There's no negotiating with it. You are at war with it. You, every morning know that when you wake up, it's looking for an opportunity to consume you. John Owen once said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. 
Brothers and sisters, are you doing that? How does Cain respond to God? Silence. He says nothing. Cain takes the path of claiming up his anger and causing tension to rise in this text. The anger on the inside is boiling up and God has now warned him. His faith was fake. His actions concealed what was truly in his heart. But God saw it and he knew the truth. God says in Hosea 6, 6, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Cain was about the externals, not the internals. And so we see from this passage an offer ha- that was rejected. And by looking at more of the biography of God, if you will, we now see why it was rejected. Cain lacked faith in God. Cain was not ruling sin. He was slowly being ruled by it. And his lack of faith has conceived in his heart anger. And in verses 8 through 16, we now see an anger manifested and a punishment given. An anger manifested and a punishment given. You see, Cain has not ruled over sin. He has entertained it. And now we will see the power of this predator to pounce and devour when one does not rule over it. And after no response is given, Cain chooses to turn his direction to his brother and speaks to his brother Abel. And in verse 8, we read some of probably the most shocking words that we can read in the Bible. While in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Cain has now gone from claiming up anger to lashing out anger. Cain's anger is unleashed. In his rage, he does the unthinkable and murders his brother. If anger is not dealt with, pain will come. Pain for the one being consumed by it and pain for those who get in its way. What Cain has done is so egregious, so heinous. It is such a betrayal. In one generation, just one, murder has taken place. Anger has morphed and manifested into murder. And it's interesting. Notice something here. Abel was innocent, wasn't he? We don't read much about Abel, do we? He's kind of a, in some ways, kind of a side character in the story. He's a very important side character. He doesn't speak. He's only in for a few verses. He seems to do nothing wrong. One could think, why, God? Why would you let Abel die? He was faithful. He did nothing wrong. Haven't you ever wondered that? In today's world that we live in, why do those who seek to be faithful to you, honor you, live for you, why do they suffer? Why are they killed by the most wicked and evil men? And I've thought about that. I've struggled with that. A number of years ago, some of you may know a story. There was a Christian man who lived close to Hamilton, um, the city of Hamilton, and he was selling a truck, and uh, some, some guys came over, and they looked at the truck, and they wanted to go for a test drive, and he hopped in with them, went driving, and they killed him, and he never came home. He, he left a wife and a young child. Heartbreaking. Don't you want to cry out, why, Lord, Why? The reality is that we have to face is that God never tells us why, doesn't he? He never tells us why. But he does tell us to trust that he is good. He is in ultimate control. Evil is evil, absolute. It's never good. But God uses that evil and he brings good from it. And if you forget that, look at the murder of Jesus. This means that God must see all and know all. Even when he asks questions, he knows the answers to. And why we see God now ask Cain a question again in verse 9. He says, Cain, where is Abel, your brother? You know, the emphasis on Abel as his brother is seen all through this passage. You know, it's seven times we see that word brother used. Six times alone in verses 8 to 11, the word brother. Where is Abel, your brother? brother. Cain, it's time to come clean. Confess. Give over your anger and ask for forgiveness. But what, what do we see? What does Cain do? What is his response? He lies. 
And then he kind of rubs it in God's face. He says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Cain has no remorse. His anger is still oozing red hot at God. Cain has not ruled sin, and because of it, it has pounced and it has devoured him. Have you ever responded like that before to someone? No? Brushed aside the obvious wrong, shoved it back in someone's face because your pride was hurt, you were angry. You know, there's a, a fallacy, a theological fallacy called the two coke fallacy. Two coke fallacy. You know, it sounds like coke. It's not coke. Uh, it's often called the U2 fallacy. The U2 fallacy. It's when someone does wrong and then they try to turn it around and point the finger back at you and say, well, you do it too. You do it too. It's a deflection. Instead of addressing their sin and owning it, they try to turn and shove it back in the other's face. This is kind of like what Cain is doing here. God, aren't you the one who's supposed to look after Abel and me? You are coming down on me, and, I, and haven't you failed, God? Am I really Abel's keeper? Isn't that your job? I mean, we know later from God's biography, Psalm 121.5, it says, The Lord is your keeper. Same word here. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. Does Cain have a right to blame God? Brothers and sisters, no matter how much pain you are going through, no matter how hard it is for you to wrap your head around why something is happening, you need to be very, very careful not to assign blame to God. When you do that, you are essentially saying, I know better than you, God. How does God respond to this blame? How does he respond to this utter disrespect? Verse 10, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. You know, this is not a light response. This is a serious, damning response. All gentleness is removed from God's voice here. Cain, the ground in which you worked, you spilled your brother's blood on it. I hear it. It is clear to me. Nothing is hidden from my eyes. I know that you murdered your brother. See, God sees and God hears everything. When you are by yourself, he sees what you're watching. When you are at work or with your friends, he hears what you guys are talking about. Your lusts and desires are as clear as if you spoke them out loud to everyone in this room. He even hears what you're choosing to think about right this very minute. Brothers and sisters, be killing sin or it be killing you. You know, I picture that this was that moment that Cain sort of trembling in his boots. You know, he's not just defiant and rebellious to just anyone. It kind of makes me remember a time in my own life where I was trembling in my boots. I was young. I was stupid. <laughs> and I, I remember I was... I had skipped school one day, and uh, yeah, yeah, I, and uh, I had been called up to the principal's office, and uh, after some back and forth or whatever, the vice principal clued in to what I had done. I had skipped school, and she's like, that's called skipping. And I remember it was kind of like in the cartoons where you're shrinking in your seat and she's getting bigger and bigger over you and it's getting darker and it's like skipping, skipping, skipping. <laughs> she was an intimidating woman. Now that, of course, does not compare to God speaking and being reprimanded by him. But what have you done? This was a thousand times worse. The act of murder is a definitive blow to someone. There's no coming back from it. When someone has been murdered, that is it. It leaves pain, loss, and hurt. There's something in us that says, God, justice must be served. And it really should be, right? But lest we forget something. Matthew 5, 20 and 22 says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. <coughs> Cain... But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. You hate someone, a brother or a sister. 
brother, sister in the Lord? Are you clamming up with them? Or are you lashing out at them? If so, brother and sister, repent. Repent. We are called to be each other's keepers. You know that? We are called to care for one another, think well of one another, love and build up one another, and to look out for one another. Sin has given birth to murder, and God is holy. So God shows the severity of sin to Cain. Justice will be served. Punishment must be given. Where we learned a short time ago at the fall, God cursed Satan and he cursed the ground, but he had not cursed Adam and Eve. Here we see he does curse Cain. He says, and now you are cursed from the ground. The very ground that yields its fruit and strength for everyone else, it will not do so for you, Cain. Where the ground was cursed from, from Adam, Cain will now be cursed from the ground. Cain will be a fugitive and a wanderer. No peace, no hope, no delights in hard work and reward from his labors. Sin brings consequences. The gravity of the punishment is starting to sink in. And verse 13, Cain sees that this is way too much for him to bear. Not only is he driven from the ground, he knows he is driven from the presence of God. The sin drives a wedge between God and people. Why? Because God is holy and just. Psalm 711 says, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation, which is anger, every day. Cain is seeing he will not have God's provision and protection any longer, so what hope does he have? Without God, his life is in jeopardy. This is a real fear, a real dread falls over him. The consequences of his actions are setting in. Being ruled by sin has led to further separation, isolation, pain, heartache, and fears for his life. So what are we to walk away from, from this passage? What do we need to be aware of and on guard of? How do you respond when you don't get what you expect, maybe what you want? And what might that reveal about you? That when sin is not ruled over, anger, pain, and consequences will follow. When sin is not ruled over, anger, pain, and consequences will follow. But see, with God, there's still grace. Amen? Even in the consequences, there's grace. In verse 15, we see God extending grace to Cain. Even after the most brutal betrayal one could ever do, the murder of his brother, even after Cain lied and kind of metaphorically kind of shoved it in God's face, God hears the pain in Cain's voice, the heartache, the realization of what is coming, and God gives a measure of grace. God ensures Cain, I will still protect you. And he marks Cain. He places this seal upon Cain, something that everyone could see and that they would know that the seal was from God. Now, we don't know what that seal looks like. We don't know what it was. But there was no mistake who sealed him. It was God. And that God sees all. It's like stealing candy from a baby. You know, if mom and dad sees you, look out. You kill Cain, God definitely sees it. Look out. God would still protect Cain even if he was not in his presence from Cain's perspective. And as Cain moves farther from Eden, farther from hope of returning, farther from the presence of God, it has become clear that he is not the one to crush the head of the serpent. The story ends in despair. Cain is not the promised one. He's not the one who will right the wrongs that his parents committed. He is worse than them. He has introduced the world to murder. What does anger conceived look like? It looks like clamming up, murder of the heart. How is anger manifested? By lashing out here, it's manifested by murder. The saga of pain and death, anger and murder will continue on and on throughout each generation. But every so often, there's a glimmer of hope. God would bring a deliverer. Is this the one? That's the question. Is this the one? And sadly, we see very quickly, no, they, are, they too are sinful, just like Cain. They are not the one to bring us back to Eden and crush the head of the serpent. Time keeps ticking. Anger and murdering continues to happen. And then one day, 
a wild-looking man in the wilderness appears, and he starts crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. And hope is ignited once more. God still sees. God still hears. He still provides and protects. He is still faithful to his promise. And we find that the one who will crush the serpent's head, who will restore his people to God in Eden, is none other than God himself. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, will enter into his creation. He would live the life that Cain failed to, the life we all failed to, a perfect and pleasing life. And he would make an offering himself. The best offering, a fully acceptable and pleasing offering, one that the Father is well pleased with. He would freely offer up his life. And why? Because he truly loves the Father. He truly loves the Father's children, and he will die for them. There is no saying no to this proposal. Jesus takes the wrath of God. He takes the consequences of sin for those who belong to the Father. Every time you clammed up, every time you lashed out in anger, he took it on the cross. Justice is satisfied. Mercy is extended. And in his words, it is finished. It is as if Jesus' foot is coming down with power, force, and finality and crushes the head of that ancient serpent. Prophecy is fulfilled. The last Adam has finally come. Jesus, who looks weak and frail, is in actuality in power, ending the reign of Satan once and for all. And Jesus' death, Satan's death was sealed. Amen? And this conqueror, this one who crushed Satan under his foot, proved his victory three days later, rising from the dead. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are also marked and sealed by God. Unlike the marking Cain received for his sin, you're marked with Christ's righteousness. Unlike the marking that left the possibility that someone could still kill Cain, your marking ensures that no one can ever kill the eternal life that God has given you. Unlike the marking showing a measure of God's grace given to Cain, your marking shows the unlimited grace found in and through Jesus Christ. And unlike the marking that would drive Cain from God's presence, this marking drives you into his presence. It drives you into intimacy and closeness with God. It says, I belong to God. I'm not cursed from God. Amen? When one repents and believes in Jesus Christ, the consequences for your sin, the punishment you deserve are laid on him. And forgiveness and his righteousness is laid on you. That's our Jesus. That's our hope. Praise God that the story does not end with Cain, but with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, thank you for Christ. Lord, if there's anger in our hearts, Lord, we repent of it now. Guard our hearts from clamming up in anger, from lashing out. Lord, we give it over to you. Christ is our hope. We lift you up now in Christ's name. Thank you, Pastor Chris, for bringing the word of God. Church, if you may rise as we sing, all glory be to Christ. Should nothing of our efforts than no legacy survive unless the Lord does raise the house in vain. It's build a strive to you who boast tomorrow's gain. Tell me what is your life amidst the vanishes at dawn of glory. Thank you. 
As we are dismissed, let me read from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Paul writes, Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. So as we are dismissed, let us go with peace with one another and peace with our God. And don't forget, at noon, there's a thing downstairs for Victoria and Ryan. All right. Thank you. We are dismissed. <laughs>